Chapter four. We're gonna jack us some ices from Jack's. Samson, age eight. Wanna play some SpongeBob? Samson yelled to his best friends, Nudie and Will. Let's get it on, Nudie shouted back. I got a bat, you got a ball? Yeah, I found one in the lot by your building, Samson said. That must have been the one I lost, Nudie replied with a grin. Nudie was a couple years younger than Samson and Will, but he was so good in baseball they loved having him around. He was skinny with peak and brown skin and a constant smile. You ain't got no dollar to buy no SpongeBob, man. You tripping, Will said with a laugh as the three friends headed to the barely paved parking lot of the Dayton Street Projects, which was filled with weeds, sparse, passive, sparse patches of grass, broken glass, and all kinds of debris. The three boys played baseball for hours in that lot during hot summer days with the hopes of one day going pro, playing for a major league team. Samson knew it was a long shot, but he felt his talents exceeded those of any kid his age, and he had big dreams. It seemed to him that baseball might be his only escape from the ghetto. Samson lived right across the street from the Dayton Street Projects. His house was nothing much, but he and his friends jokingly called it the penthouse of the projects. The Dayton Street Project, Building 6, was an eight-story building with broken elevators, abandoned apartments, and hallways that reeked with urine. Broken light bulbs decorated the halls, so the halls were always dark, even in the daytime. Residents and visitors creep, crept cautiously to their destinations, hoping no one would attack them on the trip up the littered stairs to one of the apartments. Drug dealers and buyers constantly hung out in the stairwells of the apartments, but they were so commonplace that the boys had learned to ignore them and play games in their shadow. The three boys took turns with the positions. One would pitch, aiming for a box etched in skull, box etched in chalk on the brick wall of the building. One would play the outfield, and the third would bat. It wasn't major league, but it filled up a summer afternoon. You missed that one by a mile, Samson laughed as Will struck out during his turn to bat. That's because you can't pitch, Nudie retorted. Their laughter was interrupted by an angry looking man with a deep red scar across his cheek. He ran directly towards Samson. Give me that bat, the man demanded viciously. Nudie and Will huddled close to Samson, ready to back him up if necessary. The three were tight. Samson knew better than to refuse, so without a word, he let the man, a neighborhood drug dealer known as the Bomb, snatch his bat. The Bomb, a street legend, marched over to the stairwell, cursed loudly at another man huddled there, and then proceeded to beat the man brutally with Samson's bat. The man in the stairwell, who probably had run out of money before he ran out of his need for drugs, cried out with fear and pain, and then was silent. The Bomb emerged from the stairwell, breathing hard, but looking fiercely satisfied. He tossed the bat back to Samson, who didn't catch it, but let it fall to the ground. Thanks, kid, the bomb said. Finish your game now. He disappeared down the street. The three boys, who somehow had lost their desire to play ball, headed down Dayton Street. They left the bat where it lay. They had seen it all before, and they knew they would see similar events again. It was the norm in the projects. Will spoke first. I guess that's just the way it is, man. They all knew what he meant. I don't care, Samson said. I ain't never going to do no drugs. What about selling them? Will asked. Easy money, Nudie observed. All I know is I ain't never letting nobody beat me upside my head with no bat, Samson asserted. The three boys, already numb to the chaos that surrounded them, knew that staying out of trouble was a lot harder than just talking about it. It must be 90 degrees out here, man, Samson said as they walked down Dayton Street and away from the parking lot. Spongebob always makes me thirsty, Nudie said, wiping the sweat from his forehead. Oh, I wish I had an icy, Will said, licking his lips. Extra large, Samson added. Frosty and cold. Let's go to Jack's and get us some icies. Will, who was always cracking jokes, suggested. Jack's, the corner store that sold everything from beer to bubble gum, was a familiar hangout. We ain't got no money, man, Nudie reminded him. I got an idea, Samson said. Will, you be the lookout and you make sure the way is clear. Me and Nudie will go in, get the ices, and put them in our shorts. It'll be easy. Since the boys were often without money, this was not the first time they had targeted a local store for a free snack. We're going to jack us some ices from Jack's, Will chanted as the three friends ran down the street to the little store. 
Sitting near the front of the store were a few neighborhood bums, always begging for a quarter to help them with their next high. Inside, the store smelled, like, smelled of candy and bologna and wine. Samson loved this little store, and the owner, Jack, a large Hispanic man, would often give them pieces of candy when he was in a good mood. Today, however, the weather was oppressively hot, and Jack sat near the cash register, fanning himself. The icy freezer was on the other side of the store, near the bread and the dog food. The three boys entered the store, not with their usual noise and cheerful hellos, but silently, looking around and checking behind them as if they were professional thieves. Several customers were in the store, folks who had stopped to pick up a few necessary groceries or goodies before heading home. Jack said nothing and continued to fan himself, pretending to ignore the boys. Will stood by the door as planned, whistling. Samson and Nudie tiptoed to the icy freezer and quickly filled two extra-large cups of the cold, frosty drinks. Each boy then took a cup and stuffed it inside the front of his shorts. Samson gasped as the cold cup touched his body. He never knew there could be such freezing pain. Walking slowly and awkwardly, Samson and Nudie moved toward the door, sure they had succeeded in a difficult but well-planned robbery. The bulge from the ices was ridiculously noticeable through the children's summer shorts, but they were confident in their success. Just as they reached the door, Samson felt a thick hand on the back of his t-shirt. He looked back and saw Jack, large and looming and very angry, grab Nudie as well. Will, who was supposed to have been their lookout, saw what was happening and disappeared down the street in an instant. Jack, screaming and cursing at them in both English and Spanish, dragged Samson and Nudie from the front door, where escape had only been seconds away, to the back of the store. The icy fell out of Samson's clothes onto the wooden floor of Jack's store. Samson screamed, I was going to pay for that, Jack. Come on, you know me. I come in here all the time. Jack ignored him and continued to drag the two boys through a storage room and out the back door to an area that Samson had never seen before. Samson and Nudie screamed and prayed for their lives. They'd both heard horror stories of how Jack would chop off the hands of people who stole from the store. There was a fenced-in area outside. Behind that fence stood the two biggest German shepherd dogs that Samson had ever seen. The dogs barked loudly and ferociously at all the screaming and commotion in front of them. Their teeth, sharp and gleaming, seemed unbelievably large to the small boy whose face had been pushed up against the fence. Jack yelled, You want to steal from me? I'm going to feed you to my dogs. Luis, grab the dogs and bring them here. Sam could, could smell the breath of the excited dogs as they ran around furiously, snarling, growling, and barking at the two boys, who trembled on the other side of the fence. The dogs were then removed from their cage and were now face to face with the terrified boys. The only force holding the animals back was Luis, who held the dogs lightly with a thin leather leash. Standing on their hind legs, the dogs were pulling Luis forward, trying to get a taste of Samson and Nudie. After what seemed like an eternity, Jack finally released Samson and Nudie from his grip and moved them away from the dog's cage. Samson, breathing hard but refusing to cry, blurted out, I'm sorry. Jack ignored them. Get out of my store and never come back. Samson and Nudie took off like terrified little rabbits. Never again, Samson thought as he ran home in terror. I swear, never again. But never is a very long time. As children, it was easy to think we could be successful thieves. We saw robbers and bad guys on television, and it wasn't difficult to put ourselves in those roles, especially if, from our point of view, we felt the need was great. Actually, we probably never even thought of it as stealing. We were just thirsty kids on a hot day who needed a quick and easy cool down. In those days, we didn't have any money and had to find ways to get by. It's always easy to make up a reason in your own mind to justify doing something that's just plain wrong. Perhaps we were con because we were constantly exposed to crime and negative people like the bomb, we unconsciously copied the behavior that surrounded us. We never thought about the consequences and never even considered that our stealing could get us in deep trouble. Jack's homemade theft, pre 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 theft prevention program of terrifying little thieves like us was his, with his dogs proved to be a life-changing event for me. Today, I can look back and laugh, but on that day, I truly thought the two German shepherds would eat us alive. Snarling and drooling with death in their eyes, they may have saved us from a potential life of crime. <laughs>